Welcome, welcome. Next Step Bible Church. Wow, lively crowd. I like it, I like it. Well, welcome to Next Step Bible Church, all of you that are in-house and all of you that are watching online. Uh, it's going to be an exciting day, exciting message. Uh, but I like to start off with announcements, and I have some announcements that were uh, noteworthy. So my wife made me some notes. i got to get this right. I just hope I can read her handwriting. That's a joke. She has good handwriting. All right, so the first announcement is kind of simple. Um, Frontline Men's Ministry, we do that every Tuesday at the Silva's resi Residence. Um, it's been good. We've been in the book of Luke, and there's good food, good fellowship, and good Bible study. Amen? And uh, so we meet between 6 and 8 on Tuesdays. Uh, here lately, we've had a couple new guys, uh, which has been exciting. We have a new guy in the neighborhood that I met, and uh, he attended. So that's kind of neat when you get some new folks uh, showing up. So that's Frontline Men's Ministry, Tuesdays, 6 to 8. The second uh, announcement is we're doing another, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, a craft fair. Yeah, I just slipped my mind. It, that's not written on here. So it says you should have wrote craft fair. But it does have a, a title. It's called The Mill at Christmas. There it is. There's our little graphic. Um, Suzanne, did you make that? No, all right, I can't give her credit. Never mind. Uh, she didn't do that. So anyway, she does all the other graphics. But this is Mill at Christmas in Lebanon, Tennessee. It's a Friday, Saturday event. Um, uh, I'll have a lot of my painting pastor stuff there. I do watercolors and pen and inks and, and just some art stuff. And, and uh, so you don't want to miss that. So uh, there's some details about that. This is a little bit different. So Friday, this is why I had to write this down, or have my wife write it down. Friday is from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. There is a $10 admission to this thing. It's a big, big craft fair. So um, the deal with uh, the $10 admission on Friday is uh, there's drinks and hors d'oeuvres and stuff like that. So I think the $10 like covers that part of it. And you also kind of get a sneak peek uh, and kind of like an early bird thing because Saturday is going to be... The all-day deal, Saturday is from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and so a lot of people come from all over to this deal. I heard a rumor that the parking gets filled up, and there's even sometimes some shuttle buses that bring people from other areas. So, man, it's my first time doing this, so sounds pretty awesome. So, anyway, join us. Come out and support us. We're not trying to do this to make a buck, like I say, about all of our craft fairs. We just want to get out in the community. We want to meet people. We want to... Just get known. People are like, who's Next Step Bible Church? Well, that's a good way to, to uh, talk to people, ask them if they need prayer or if they're looking for a church or men's Bible study or women's Bible study, all that good stuff. So anyway, um, I get to shake a lot of hands and meet a lot of people, so I'm totally in my element. <laughs> and so anyway, that is coming up this Friday and this Saturday. Oh, you already took the graphic down. Man, see, I wasn't finished. See, there we go. November 1st and 2nd. I was looking for the dates. That's what, All right. All right. So that's the announcements. I did my part. I hope I passed. Did I do well, babe? All right, y'all. My love language is words of affirmation, so you can keep it coming. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. So anyway, uh, so in this portion, uh, we're going to start our praise and worship. So if you would stand to your feet, raise your hands, raise your voice, raise whatever, and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Just don't annoy your neighbor so much, but um, it's all good. Let's crank the music up. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I had somebody on our YouTube page say, ask me a question. Why don't you ever introduce yourself? Because those of us who are out of state, we know it's Next Step Bible Church, but we don't know who you are. And I never really thought about that because I really don't like my name being a part of any of that. But I am Danny Bean the lead pastor of Next Step Bible Church. And I guess I need to start introducing myself because we have online followers and people watching us and go, who's this guy up here talking? So uh, whether it's good or bad, <laughs> I guess I need to start introducing myself. And I was called out for that. I'm like, yeah, that's a valid point. So anyway, I think I'm going to start doing that. But welcome to Next Step Bible Church. Uh, wow. We just love the Lord around here. We, we stand on God's word around here. We do it boldly, but not in a... Uh, abrasive way or not too abrasive anyway but uh anyway we've been in an exodus series for a very long time 31 weeks to be exact 
wow, that's a long time. But you know what? We're not in a hurry. Um, uh, we, we've learned a lot. We've plowed a lot of ground in Exodus. And so this is uh, week 31, the final message. Um, and so I'm going to start off in prayer like I like to do and get all set up up here. And let's get in it. So Lord Father God, I'm so grateful to walk into this building. I'm so grateful to be in your presence. I know your presence is everywhere, but I feel it a little extra in this house, your house, Father God. So Lord, meet all of us, each and every one of us, where we are at, meet all of us here. Lord, I pray that there's something said today um, through your word or you speaking through me, Lord, that uh, grows us, shapes us, convicts us, whatever. You have your way with us, Father God. So, Lord, we just give you all the praise and glory. I pray also, like I always do, may I decrease so you increase inside of me. I need every ounce of you, Holy Spirit, that I can get. This is not about me 1%. It's 100% about you and your kingdom, Father God. So, Lord, you're welcome here. Show up, show off, and show out. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Exodus series number 31. <laughs> The title of today's message is kind of interesting. It's called Fair Weathered Followers. Now, I had a whole different title for this message up until this morning. My wife had made a graphic and everything. And as I do every Sunday morning, I get a good old cup of coffee. I go down in my basement where my office, church office is. I pop open my laptop, start going through notes. Every Sunday, God has something to add or for me to tweak on the message. Um, I would do it a disservice not to do Sunday morning prep because God always has one last little thing, if not a couple last little things. He had a couple last little things today, and one was uh, the title was to be changed. And so uh, I'm like, okay. I was a little nervous to tell Suzanne because like last minute I need you to, to get back, drop everything you're doing, you know, her hair's all wet and she's drying, blow drying it and getting ready to like put all that away. Get, get, put on your, 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 your graphic artist cap and uh, make up another graphic. And she threw this together, which is amazing. She can just boom, boom, boom. Fair weather followers. So like I said, it's last message in the Exodus series. 31 long weeks. <laughs> I could probably teach a half dozen more lessons here in Exodus but I do think it's time to wrap it up. And as I was reading the remaining eight chapters, yeah, you heard that right. There's still eight chapters in Exodus. Um, what I decided to do is to go through all eight chapters. Yay. Um, uh, watch this though. And really just do highlights, uh, the key points of each of the chapters. And then I want to get to the main message, which is, what is my overall take of the book of Exodus? And my overall take can be found in the title. The Israelites were fair weather followers. Boy, were they. So if you don't know what a, a fair weather friend is, we'll get into that later, um, which obviously ties into the fair weather followers. All right, well, here's the odd thing. Now, most weeks I do expository teaching word by word, line by line. This is one of those rare occasions where I'm going to say, don't get your Bible out. What? <laughs> yeah. In this next step, Bible church, it is. But here's the deal. I'm going to run through eight chapters of highlights. Uh, I don't want to burden you with turning all these pages. I didn't burden Nicole with all bunch of scripture, there's, there's a lot. So I'm just going to hit the highlights, kind of a, a, a speed thing. What I want you to do is really just pay attention. If you do have a notebook and pen, jot down some notes, do that. Um, just kind of sit back and, and listen and be taught. Does that make sense? Yes. I don't do that very often at all. But today's one of those days because, <laughs> uh, yeah, otherwise <laughs> you might be mad at me by the end of the service. <laughs> In your Bible, the pages of your Bible might be smoking. <laughs> so anyway... So that is it. Okay, so let's begin. We're going to begin in chapter 33. Like I said, these are just highlights, bullet point, uh, notes, if you want to uh, call it that. So um, 
let's get into it. Chapter 33, some of the highlights are as follows. In chapter 33, God commands Israel to leave Mount Sinai. This is kind of a big deal because um, they escaped Egypt and the, the, the rule of the Pharaoh. They were in bondage. They were in slavery. And a bunch of really cool stuff happened. Uh, they had to cross uh, the Red Sea. It was parted supernaturally. And then it caved in on the Pharaoh's army, killing all of them. And, and then they were out in the wilderness. And, and so uh, they come to this Mount Sinai. If you haven't uh, kept up with the series, or is this your first time tuning in on YouTube or whatever? Kind of giving a quick backstory. But they've been camped out here at Mount Sinai for a while, and Moses has been going up on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord has been t uh, teaching and talking uh, to Moses, giving him commands, giving him principles, and on and on and on. Go back and read all that, but that's kind of where we're at here. So finally, here in chapter 33, God commands Israel to leave Mount Sinai. Pack up your camp. <laughs> roll up your tents and get out of here. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And in verse 1, I'm going to read uh, three verses real quick here in chapter 33. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, I guess that's how you say that, and the Hivites, and the Jebusite. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. So here it is. Get out of this Mount Sinai and start heading that way. Um, Moses asked God to show himself in this chapter. I think that's a, you know, Every one of these things I could do a full-blown message on. But I feel like this is it. You know, God's like, all right, wrap it up, put a bow on it, we're done. <laughs> so this is one of those things. I think this is an interesting thing. Moses asked God while he's up on Mount Sinai to reveal himself to him. I want to see you, God. In verse 18, it says, and he said, please show me your glory. Then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, that's a capital H, so that's God. God said, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. I'm going to stop right there. Does that make sense? No man can see my face and live. That says a whole lot right there about how big God is, how holy God is. The omnipotent, the omnipresent God, the great I am, the alpha and the omega. You cannot see my face and live because we're just mere humans. See, God resides in the supernatural. We reside over here in the natural. And we cannot see the presence of God until we step out of the natural and into the supernatural realm called heaven. Oh, we'll get to see God's face someday, but not yet. Mm. No man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, watch this, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back and my face shall not be seen. Wow. So Moses does get to see a glimpse of God. Just his back, but it's a glimpse. Woo! And he didn't kill Moses, but it changed Moses. When he came off that mountain, he was different. He looked different in multiple ways. We'll get into that in a minute. In chapter 34, some of the highlights are Moses goes back up to Mount Sinai one more time before they depart. God makes two more stone tablets. And the covenant between God and Israel was renewed. Because remember, he was angry last week and he threw down the two tablets of stone and broke them in righteous anger. 
Well, God gives them two new ones. In verse 10, it says, and he said, behold, I will make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth. Wow, that's huge right there. Nor in any nation and all the people, I love whenever the word all in there, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. That's encouraging. And then verse 11 says, observe what I command you this day. All right, when Moses returns, like I said, from the presence of the presence of the Lord, his face glows. You heard that right? It glows in such a way it freaks everybody out. He's been in the presence of the Lord. He's seen the back of the Lord. His hair is white. His face glows. It illuminates, if you will, because he witnessed God's glory firsthand. Verse 29, now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. He's probably like, why is everybody looking at me weird? I got a little mustard, a little ketchup, but what's going on? A little something on my beard? (laughs) No, dude, your face is glowing. It's weird. You stay over there. You may be radioactive right now. We don't know. (laughs) Verse 30. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. I would be too. (laughs) If Suzanne walked out of the hallway into the living room and her face was glowing, I'd say, whoa, sister, back up. (laughs) What is going on? What did you put on that face of yours? <laughs> I don't know if I should freak out or rebuke it or what. But Moses is glowing like crazy. All right, moving on. I think I said, you should go read that part. It's a pretty interesting thing. Like I said, I could teach a message on that by itself. Because uh, And what I would teach on if I preach a message on just like that, you can never be in the presence of God and look the same again. Right. Oh, come on. I got goosebumps. That was, good. that was good. All right, chapter 36, we're moving on. The people go above and beyond in their service of giving. I think this is cool. In verse 4, it says, Then all the craftsmen who are doing all the work of the sanctuary, uh, they're starting to put all the, uh, the, the materials together to build this tabernacle that they were instructed to build. It says, All the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing. And they spoke to Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. Then they proceeded to build the tabernacle. Isn't that something? I think that's pretty cool. Hey, guys, we need these, these list of materials. Everybody scattered and, and gathered the materials, made the materials or whatever. And they showed back up. They said, well, we got more than enough. Everybody stop. <laughs> Everybody stop. That's one cool thing about Next Step Bible Church. When we get on mission and we want to go serve the community, it's almost like too many, too many people show up. <laughs> too, too much is given. That's a joke. You can air out give. But you know, anyway. It's just amazing how everybody jumps on board. They want to be a part of it. I love that about Next Step Bible Church. They were experiencing this here with the Israelites. They had so much. It says the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. That's awesome. All right, moving into chapter 37. The ark and the mercy seat was made as well as the table of showbread. The golden lampstand was also also carefully created as the altar of the incense. So all these furnishings and the things that that are going in the tabernacle and around the tabernacle has all being made here. Um, In in chapter 38, the altar of burnt offering and the bronze laver was made. That's pretty cool. In chapter 39, the details of the garments of the priesthood are created. And the completion of it is seen in verses 32 and 33, which I will read. It says, thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the meeting was finished. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, and all of its furnishings. Okay. An interesting side note, uh, that I learned about the tabernacle 
as I've, I've, I've been doing a lot of uh, research and reading about the tabernacle, I just, I taught on it a couple of weeks ago and, and it's kind of lit this fire. I'm very fascinated with the tabernacle and, and this mobile sanctuary that are going to be moving throughout the desert. I just think it's a, amazing. It's, it's, it's cool. And so one of the things I discovered recently that I haven't mentioned before, but I do want to mention here, that the tabernacle, it took 2,400 pounds of gold. I'll say that again. Think about that. You know, we sell gold by an ounce. An ounce. <laughs> the Israelites had pounds of it. L lots and lots of pounds. 2,400 pounds of gold was required to build what God told them to build. Oh, it gets even bigger. 8,000 pounds of silver was required. Silver is also sold by the ounce here, by the way. Here's talking about pounds. 8,000 pounds of silver. Also, 6,000 pounds of brass. It took all that to build the furnishings and such. It also took seven months for them to build it all. This wasn't an overnight thing. This was, this was a major, major undertaking. This had to be right. Uh, God gave Moses specific, specific details on building this tabernacle. This mobile sanctuary. All right, and in chapter 40, the tabernacle was erected and arranged. Wow. Can you imagine all this work, all this, uh, this effort has been pouring into this uh, tabernacle and it's assembled, it's erected. You, they, they had to all just stand back in awe because, you know, God uh, designed it. God was the architect of this. He said, hey, he, God is always in partnership with man, though. Here's what I want you to do, man. I want you to do this, 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 and this. I want you to build this, this, and this, and this. I want you to carve this, this, and this, and this. And they put it all together. And when it came together, it was glorious. They all had to just stand back and wonder. And here's the cool thing. They knew that God was the architect, but they had to also take pride that God decided to use them to be a part of it. And they were proud of their craftsmanship. It says in Scripture that, that when uh, the people started to craft these things, the Lord gave them a special anointing of knowledge and craftsmanship to build this stuff. Because I think about it, they were never trained. They didn't go to school for this stuff. They didn't go to trade school. Their daddies, you know, a lot of this, you know, they got to figure this out in the desert. <laughs> now they had workshops and stuff like that. Think about all that. God gave them an anointing. He gave them like supernatural ability. Wow. So when they put it all together and it was erected, can you imagine? They go, this is amazing. Hallelujah. I love thinking outside the box like that. In verse 34 of chapter 40, it says, then the, the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You know, until that moment, it was this, uh, 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 an assembly of some amazing stuff, but it wasn't until God's presence touched it that it became the holy tabernacle. That makes me think, you know, with, with our own efforts and with our own will as humans, we can build some pretty nice stuff. There's some pretty nice church buildings that's built out there. There's also some pretty nice church buildings out there where the Holy Spirit isn't a part of it. Isn't that sad? It is. I see it more and more and more. I'm going to read verse 34 again. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's, that was a shift right there. Hallelujah. And that's where the book of Exodus comes to an end. I told you just highlights. Boom, 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 boom. That's funny. I told myself, this is going to take eight or 10 minutes. I look at my clock. It's 18 minutes. Great. <laughs> Whew. We haven't even started the message yet. Too bad. All right, Exodus comes to an end. The Israelites would journey through the wilderness for 40 years. The tabernacle would be erected five times in Gilgad, in Shiloh, in Bethel, in Nob, and in Gibeon. That was a major undertaking, putting all that together again and again and again. I'm sure they had teams. <laughs> your, your team wall, your, your team door, your team veil. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Let's, let's get it going. 
Moses wouldn't ever get to walk into the promised land physically. But the Lord did allow him to see it with his own eyes from afar before he died. Joshua would carry the torch after Moses died. Joshua would lead them into the land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the crazy part. It isn't in the very next book or the book after that. It's not until we get into the book of Joshua, chapter 21, verses 43 and 45, that we read of God's promise being fulfilled. Joshua 21, 43 and 45 says, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give their fathers. There it is. And they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. That's awesome. That's a miracle. The Lord delivered all, there's that word all again. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Mm. You know, that's something we can stand on because our God is a promise keeper. God is a promise keeper. There's so many, so many, so many promises throughout Scripture that we can stand on boldly. God is a promise keeper. Amen? As I reflected on, the, on this journey we've taken through the book of Exodus, and it's been quite a long journey. I don't want no amens. <laughs> Sometimes it felt like it took 40 years to make it through Exodus. It just took 31 weeks. I asked myself this. I was at my desk. I'm like, all right, here we are. We're at the end of Exodus. What do I do here? And so that's to ask myself, what is my overall take? What's my takeaway from the whole book of Exodus? If you, if, if, if you just read the whole book of Exodus and say, like, all right, Pastor Danny, what's your takeaway? That the Israelites, <laughs> I call them hard-headed Hebrews. The Lord calls them stiff-necked people. Today, we're going to call them fair-weathered followers. Mm. Just like the Lord, uh, I was very disappointed at these hard-headed Hebrews and their lack of obedience and lack of faith. So that's going to be the main lesson for today. But I had some positive takeaways. Uh. I love how God protected and provided for Moses as a vulnerable baby in a basket that floated down the river. That's one of my favorite messages of this book was, was Moses, baby Moses in the basket. I love how it made that real. Imagine taking your baby, your own baby, put it in a basket out on the water and letting it float away in faith. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. There's just some things in the Bible. I'm like, you know, if I was in that situation, could I do it? Yeah, I could do that. Could I do this? Mm. No, I couldn't do it. That's good. And I'd get too emotional. I'd protect that baby with my life. You have to kill me first. But that's not what happened to Moses. They, they released him in that baby basket on the river in faith. And that baby was saved. There was a plan all along. So I love that part. That's one of my takeaways. Uh was God's love for Moses and his provision and protection. I love God's overall favor on Moses' life. Moses was a Hebrew that was raised in the palace. The very babies they were killing, he had God's favor. He's in the palace. He gets educated. The Egyptian uh, community was, was uh, the highest most educated uh, kingdom in the whole world. And Moses was raised in that. He was educated in that. <laughs> it's just amazing. I love that. So there are some really awesome takeaways overall in Exodus. But this message is called Fair Weather Followers. As I've mentioned many times, it's important to know that Scripture was written to us, but it was written for us. 
So as we look at the book overall, what do we learn from this? It's not written to us, it's written for us. What can we look at this and learn from, about it? I've learned the importance of faith. I've learned the importance of obedience. And I've learned uh, the importance of trusting the Lord. And I learned most, if not all of that, through Moses. <laughs> Didn't learn it with the Israelites. I learned it through Moses. Moses really ministered to me in this whole series. Wow, Lord, let, let me be more like Moses. God gave uh, Moses assignments that was crazy difficult. Approaching the king, confronting the king, arguing with the king. Are you kidding me? The dude can cut your head off at any moment. But Moses, and Moses would even say, this might be our last day. <laughs> this may be it for me. Whatever. I'm still going to obey. Wow. Would you obey the Lord if you knew he was sending you on something you could probably die of? I had this random thought. It'd be like uh, sending me in the middle of Iraq. And I stand in the middle of Iraq and say, this is the Bible, praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you all about Jesus. You know, machine guns and bazookas are going to come out of that point. They're going to go smoke you, man. That's a death sentence. That's pretty much what he was doing here. Go to the Pharaoh. Perform some miracles, this, that, and the other. Wow. I learned all that from Moses. If you're taking notes, jot this down. Spiritual maturity comes from obedience not age. Mm, I love when you guys <laughs> smile and nod. Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit right there. It wasn't Danny Bean. Spiritual maturity comes from obedience, not age. What this means is I've encountered many old people that are spiritually immature, and I've encountered many young people that are very spiritually mature. It blows me away some of these youngsters. Man, they just... They, they find it, they discover it, and they just jump into God's word. And it's just like, I don't like you, you little punk, because you're already absorbing so much and you're growing so fast. It's intimidating to an old dude like me. But anyway, I'm honestly happy to see that happen. I have seen some young pe people just get it. Boom. And they become very spiritually mature quickly. It's because God has a call on their life. That's what it is. The anointing starts flowing as they start feeding on God's word. It's amazing. And then you have some old people who've been going to church for years and years and years, decades, decades, decades. They have cobwebs on their Bible. Going to church is more of a social thing. It's not about a relationship with the Lord. And they just are spiritually immature their whole lives. Too many Christians remain on milk long after they should have been weaned. And if you look into that, it's because of their lack of obeying God's word. They may know God's word, but knowing God's word and obeying God's word are two complete different things. I may know what the speed limit is. That doesn't mean I obey the limit. I know who you speed demons are out here. I know. Don't be pointing at anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's you, honey. Anyway, I may know the speed limit. That doesn't mean I'm going to obey the limit. Same thing. You may know God's word, but you're not obeying it. Two different things. I want to tell you that just one act of obedience to the Lord is more powerful than listening to a thousand sermons. You heard that right. What, Pastor Danny? Yes. I'm about to prove it. Just one act of obedience. It's better than listening to a thousand sermons. You know why? Because the key word was act. One act of obedience is better than listening uh, to a thousand sermons. You see the difference there? Mm. Back in the day, they used to have door-to-door -door salesmen. One of the greatest salesmen of all time said, you can listen and learn how to be a salesman, but... Until you, you go knock on some doors, you won't ever make a single sell. Mm. In other words, you got to put action to what you've heard, what you've learned. So one act of obedience is more powerful than listening to a thousand sermons. Mm. Another thing to jot down if you're taking notes. 
Obedience produces growth. Obedience produces growth. As we read through Exodus, time and time again, the Israelites disobeyed. They complained. They were ungrateful. They were spiritually immature. Because truth without obedience is hypocrisy. I'll say that again. Truth without obedience is hypocrisy. As Christians, we cannot just hear the profound truth of the gospel, but not obey it. As you obey it, you grow. As you obey, your faith is strengthened. (laughs) Early one morning, a pastor was traveling to an important conference that he had been asked to speak at. This is a true story. While at the airport, he felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit telling him not to board the airplane that was about to take off. He stopped and discerned if it was in fact the voice of the Lord warning him not to board the flight. That was an important part right there. Knowing confidently that it was in fact the voice of the Lord, he obeyed. He picked up his briefcase and went home. Later that afternoon, he had heard the devastating news that the plane had crashed and nobody had survived. Looking over at his wife, both were horrified and in tears for those on board. A few days went by as the couple processed the tragedy. Then the wife asked her husband, If God told you not to board the plane, why didn't he tell the others? He answered, Perhaps God did tell the others, but maybe I was the only one that obeyed his voice. Come on, I got goosebumps. Come on. God is always speaking, but are you listening? Hmm. One of the biggest prayers, and I say this over and over, Lord, give us ears to hear your voice. And give us the strength to obey it. (laughs) Careful what you ask for. Because he'll start telling you to do some crazy stuff. And that's where the second part is. Give me the strength to obey it. Oh, you want to hear my voice? Okay, I want you to go do this. Oh, that's way out of my comfort zone. You asked. Careful what you ask for. It might be just safer if you don't hear from the Lord. Just to to let you know. Because I did that to God. and I'm standing in a pulpit because of that. I (laughs) never asked to be in a pulpit. I started hearing him. He goes, all right, now you're going to obey what I say? (laughs) I don't want to do none of that, Lord. That's what I have for you. Yes or no? Boom. Be careful. But God is always speaking. Are you listening? God conversed with Moses regularly, and Moses obeyed. But yet when Moses would share what the Lord had spoken to the Israelites, they did not listen. Mm. God even spoon-fed them through Moses. God could have just told him himself. He said, Moses, go tell these stiff-necked people what I said. So he'd go do it. (laughs) He spoon-fed them. God speaks through his word. He speaks through others to you. He speaks through providence. And he speaks to you through the Holy Spirit. There's lots of different ways God will speak to you. But he will speak to you. I get more pushback on that from Christians. That just blows my mind. Whatever. Don't get me going on that. Too many times... You will miss what God is telling you because you're too busy, too distracted. Satan loves to get us too busy and too distracted because we're too busy. We don't slow down enough to be still and know that I'm God. We don't slow down and listen. God gave us two ears and one mouth. We should be listening twice as much as we yap. The word obedience comes from a word that means to give great attentiveness to. Did you know that? I discovered that like two days ago. The word obedience comes from a word that means to give great attentiveness to. Are you giving great attentiveness to God's word and to his commands? Maybe that's your next step today. When God speaks to you, you have two simple options, obedience or disobedience. Pretty simple. God's word is very clear on things that we should do, things we should refrain from, what we should say and what we shouldn't. His word is clear on how we should think and things we should avoid thinking about, such as hate, bitterness, coveting, lust, and so on. 
It all comes down to a choice. I love to remind people that the devil cannot make you sin. All he can do is offer up a choice. Mm. It's what we do with that choice. Mm. When God's grace changes us from being a rebel to being redeemed, we are empowered by his Holy Spirit to obey him. Your outlook should, should be, I love to obey the Lord, not, ugh, I have to obey the Lord. You get to obey the Lord. When we obey God, we are blessed. When we obey God, we are protected. When we obey God, we have favor. When we obey God, we have provision. It pleases the Lord. Obedience always, always, always gets the attention of God. We can see that through Moses' Moses's obedience as he was blessed, protected, and provided for. He had favor, and the Lord was pleased with Moses. God used Moses. Of all the people God could have used, he chose to use Moses. Let me remind, let me remind you that Moses was an outcast, a criminal, and a murderer on the run. But guess what? God didn't look at his past. God looked at Moses' willingness to obey him. Mm. That gives all of us hope. All of us, no matter how jacked up your past is, God's more worried about your future. He's worried about your obedience. He's worried about your heart. That's what he can use. Mm. He used Moses and chose Moses. And through that, Moses changed history. Ooh, I love that. Hey, being obedient isn't easy. Another story. Sometimes it'll cost you. A man's supervisor told him to lie about some of the numbers on an account their firm represented. But the man knew that would be disobeying God's word on being truthful. So he told, so being the man of character and integrity, he told his supervisor he would not be dishonest and fix the numbers. He was fired on the spot. His obedience cost him his job, but it didn't cost him his right standing in the eyes of the Lord. Sometimes being obedient will cost you. A.W. Tozer said, the true follower of Christ doesn't ask, if I embrace the truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he will say, this is the truth. God, help me walk in it. Let come what may. In other words, I'm doing the right thing no matter what it costs me. We all need to have that mindset. Do you realize that the greatest gift you can give to your spouse, to your kids, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your employer is obedience to God? Because when you walk in righteousness, your spouse, your kids, friends, neighbors, employer, they can all trust you. They can all depend on you. And that is priceless. There's an old saying, a man's the only good as, uh, uh, as his word. You promise to do something, follow through, have integrity, have character. And then when you do, from that point forward, you've proven yourself. You're trustworthy. That's priceless. I trust my wife with every ounce of my being. I'm going to have to brag on her for a minute, so... I'm warning you, babe. But my wife is so obedient to God. Her integrity is impeccable. In our 19 years of marriage, I have never, and I mean never, seen her flirt once with another man. I have never heard her lie. I have never witnessed her treating someone poorly or unfair. Suzanne takes God's word very seriously, and it shows all of Suzanne's friends know that she has their backs like no other. They can rely on her. They can depend on her and trust her 100% of the time. It's just who she is. I try to keep up with her awesomeness, but I fall way too short, although I keep trying. I am blessed beyond measure for my awesome bride. Proverbs 31, 10, and 11 says, What can find who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he 
will have no lack of gain. Hallelujah. A virtuous wife is a wife that is obedient to the Lord. I am so grateful. She is such a great witness, and she deserves that. She don't like that kind of attention or focus, but I have to brag on her. I am a very blessed man. I'll say it again. The greatest gift you can give your spouse, to your kids, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your employer is obedience to God. It's the best gift you can give. Obedience has a generational effect. We saw that disobedience also had an effect on the Israelites. So much so, God wanted to kill them all at one point and called them a stiff-necked people. I love that because I think the Bible is just awesome. People are like, the Bible's boring. You're not reading it right. That's awesome. Suzanne and I have personally seen the benefits of our obedience in our kids. We see God's hands on, hand on each one of them. Their favor blows our minds. Hallelujah, God is so good. In Deuteronomy 12, 28, it says, Observe and obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. Did you catch that? Just like sin and rebellion can ride a bloodline, obedience and favor can ride a bloodline as well. Ooh, I love that. Hallelujah. We see throughout Scripture how Israel's disobedience affected them long term. So I have a question. How do you know if you love Jesus? <laughs> kind of one of those man of the mirror questions. Imagine you're standing in front of a mirror and you're looking at yourself. How do I know if I love Jesus? Well, let me give you an answer. Obedience proves your love for Jesus. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus asks, If you love me, or he doesn't ask, he, command, he says, if you love me, obey my commandments. How simple, yet how difficult. If you love me, obey my commandments. Mm. And we do that out of a healthy fear of the Lord. Love and obedience go hand in hand. The danger is when we know God's commands, but edit them to our liking or our desires. I'm going to say that again. Yeah, I know, right? Love and obedience go hand in hand. The danger is when we know God's commands, but edit them to our liking or our desires. You are not allowed to edit God's commands. You are not ever allowed to edit the scripture. It is what it is. You either follow or you don't. You're either obedient or you're disobedient. Too many people change scripture to fit their lives instead of changing their lives to fit scripture. Oh, I love that. I love that. Too many people change Scripture to fit their lives instead of changing their lives to fit Scripture. That's the world we're living in right now. We're going to talk more about that next week. The Israelites struggled with keeping God's commands. Even after they had promised to, this exposed their lack of genuine love for the Lord. Have you ever heard of the term fair weather friend? Here's where we're going to get into the title part. A fair weather friend is a friend that stops being a friend in times of difficulty. When things are going great, when things are just awesome, oh, they're your best buddy. But let things go crazy, boom, they're gone. They disappear. Where'd they go? I don't know. That's a fair weather friend. Well, the Israelites were fair weather followers. They stopped being followers when things got difficult. How many times would you see that over and over and over? How many times did they say, why'd you bring us out of Egypt just for us to die in the desert when they were thirsty? Why did you bring us out of Egypt just to die in the desert when they got hungry? Man, fair weather followers. When things was good and glorious, hallelujah, it's great. God is good. Everybody's dancing, praising the Lord. There's a lot of manna. There's, there's, there's food and water and everything's great. Then they get out in the desert and things get just a little bit tough. Boom. <laughs> Where's this God of ours? <laughs> Moses, what's going on? They complain, complain, complain. They lose their faith. Fair weather followers. That's why this message is titled that. 
Mature obedience is, God, is doing God's will, God's way, and in God's timing. Has nothing to do with your will, your way, or your timing. See, that's the way we always want it. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. Another way to put it is, obedience is doing what God says, when God says it, and how God says it. Amen? That's mature obedience. I love to say, know your shepherd's voice and always obey it, like I said a minute ago. God gave Ten Commandments to the Israelites, and they didn't obey them. Their disobedience led them into witchcraft when they made for themselves a golden calf to worship. Your disobedience can be an open door for the enemy. God doesn't give us these commands as a list of rules to oppress us. He gives us this list of rules to protect us. Something's happening outside, man. Do you realize the trouble, the despair, the burdens we would never experience if we just simply obey God? Do you realize how many marriages would flourish if we just obeyed Scripture? I counsel far too many adults who are dealing with the effects of abuse, of neglect, of dysfunction because of rebellious parents that did not obey God trickle-down effect. Do you know that God prefers obedience over worship? Hmm. Like, what, Pastor Danny? I'll say that again. Do you know that God prefers obedience over worship? Think about that for a minute. God prefers obedience over worship. You can worship until you lose your voice. But if you aren't obeying God's words, you're just making noise. That may step on some toes. It's in Scripture multiple times. One example is in 1 Samuel 15, 22, and 23. Watch this. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Then it goes on to say, To obey is better than sacrifice. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. God prefers obedience over worship. You can replace the word worship with other things, like God prefers obedience over serving. God prefers obedience over volunteering. God prefers obedience over giving. The passage I just read says that the Lord delights in obedience more than burnt offerings and sacrifice, which both are forms of worship. You can sacrifice. You can do the burnt offerings. I'd rather have obedience. What the Lord says. Then on the flip side of this shows how serious, how seriously toxic disobedience is. Because in the last passage we read, it also says, for rebellion, which is disobedience, is like the sin of divination and arrogance, which is pride, like the evil of idolatry. You can show up to church every Sunday. You can worship. You can sing more passionately than the whole congregation. You can look the part better than anyone. But if you're not obedient to God's word and God's ways, you're not Just wasting your time, you're offending God. He wants obedience. Because when we obey him, it shows we love him. It's not like he's this guy's like, obey me, obey me, obey me. No, you obey because you love the Lord. Watch this. This is profound. This, this, (laughs) I've been waiting this whole message for this part right here. I'm so giddy. <laughs> watch this, watch this. It's so profound. I had this aha moment as I prepared for this message. You ready for this? Listen up. God is the only employer that will fire his employee, but let him still keep his job. Like, what? Oh, yeah. Let me, oh, I'm going to share. I'm going to explain. God is the only employer that will fire his employee, but let him remain at the job. I can't wait to hear this, Pastor Danny. Oh, yeah. Watch this. 
And 1 Samuel 15 is the story of the first king of Israel, Saul. And how that king forfeited his future and his anointing through disobedience, yet he kept his position as king. He remained on the throne and he still wore the crown. God let him keep his job, but took his hand off him, took his anointing off him, and took his calling from him. God basically fired him, but let him keep his job. Here's my aha moment. There are pastors all over this place that God has fired, but they still have a job. Oh, <laughs> There's pastors that are still in the pulpit that got fired a long time ago. God took his hand off their ministry, took the anointing away from them, took their calling from them. They still got a job. They still show up every day to that church. But they were fired a long time ago. Ooh. I often watch pastors, and I use that term lightly, knowing, me knowing, that they aren't the real deal anymore. They used to be, but not anymore. And I'd wonder, why in the world would God allow a shepherd to continue shepherding his flock? (laughs) I wrote down these notes as, as the Holy Spirit was flowing. Some of these pastors may carry the title but they don't carry the anointing. Thank you, Lord. Then the Lord said, they may look like a shepherd, but a real shepherd smells like the sheep. Oh. They may look good on the outside, Pastor Danny, but they're spiritually dead on the inside. They may have a job, but God fired them a long time ago. Wow, wow, wow. But then God didn't stop there. (laughs) I thought he was done. Sharpen your pencil, Pastor Danny. Because some of these pastors may appear to have it together in the pulpit. Behind the scenes, their marriage is horrible. Their kids are all jacked up. Their house is out of order. They lie effortlessly. They deceive everyone. They fleece their flock. The church finances are out of whack and hidden from public. Their bank accounts are full, but their character is empty. Wow! (laughs) Wow! All right, Lord, I got the picture. He goes, too many pastors I fired a long time ago, but they still have a job. Ooh. (laughs) Too many pastors have an agenda. They have an angle. They have impure motives, and it sickens me. I fear the Lord when I step into this pulpit. Mm. Where's the fear of the Lord for these other pastors? Come on, man. God says, you're fired, saith the Lord. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I want the anointing. I want God in me. I want the fear of the Lord in me. I want his promotion. I want his elevation, not for me, but for his glory. I don't know about you, but I want new wine and fresh wine skin. Amen. I want a holy touch from God Almighty. I want the Holy Spirit pouring out of me everywhere I go, whether it's a gas station, Walmart, wherever. I just want to exude the Holy Spirit, not for me, but for God's glory. Because there's something different about you, Danny Bean. Oh, there's a lot different about me. But one of the main things is the Holy Spirit and my zeal for the Lord. I'm passionate about the Lord. I can't help it. It's not fake. It's just who I am. Jot this down if you're taking notes. There's another one. God only anoints his obedient followers. Nicole, you can start the music now. God only anoints his obedient followers. The Israelites witnessed God's protection as he delivered them from bondage, yet they disobeyed. The Israelites watched the plagues consume Egypt on every level. They saw these miraculous wonders, yet they still disobeyed. The Israelites watched God break down the Pharaoh, proving he is the king of kings. Even seeing that, they still disobeyed. 
They walked into a miracle as the Red Sea parted with the Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit. Yet they didn't trust God later on. God provided water and food as they journeyed in the wilderness. And yet they complained and lacked faith. God revealed himself to the Israelites and spoke to all of them in an audible voice from Mount Sinai. Yet they went on to make an idol to worship in God's place. It's easy for us to point a finger at these Israelites. But the truth is we all do the same thing. We will praise God and worship God. We'll sing songs and attend Bible studies. But let one thing go wrong and we act as if God has been absent the whole time. We become fair weather followers. Mm. This is why I think it's important to write down all of God's blessings in your life. You need to jot down every awesome testimony. And I'm talking journal it. You need it physically written down. So when that problem shows up, when that doctor tells you a uh, 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 a diagnosis that you don't want to hear and you need to stand on something, you go back to these promises that God's done for you, all these testimonies God's done for you, the times he showed up, healing, restoration, provision, boom, 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 boom. You stand on that. You're like, I I rebuke that. I don't receive this word. I'm going to stand over here on my faith because I know what my God can do. Otherwise, you're a fair weather follower over here and you go, oh, my world's falling apart. The sky's falling. Where you at, God. No, you look at your, all your testimonies, and we all have tons of testimonies. I know every single one of you. We all have awesome testimonies. I'm telling you, write them down. And when things get hard, things get tough, and you start kind of questioning things, you go back to that. Mm. Remember, you don't have a testimony until you've gone through a test. And everybody in this room has been through tests. I know. I know all of you too well. <laughs> I have... I, I have, I have catalogs of the testimonies. In fact, I can't stand when somebody asks me to share my testimony. I'm like, which one? I got them in categories. I do that on purpose. That strengthens my faith. I love the Lord. He's been there so many times and I could testify over and over and over. I am not a fair weather follower. I refuse to be. The Israelites didn't do any of this. They complained. They didn't trust. They were immature. That's my big takeaway from the book of Exodus. Let us learn from their mistakes and their mishaps. Remember, Exodus wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. What an awesome journey this has been. There are so many things we can look at what Moses did and take from it. There's so many things the Israelites said and did that we cannot do in our lives. I hope the the series has blessed you. It's been a blessing to me. It's uh, grown me, stretched me. Uh, I love, love, love God's word. I I can't drink it up enough. I I just, I love it. If I'm addicted to anything, I'm addicted to... uh, to my God and his word. I I just, I stand on this every day. I lean on it every day. It gets me through so much stuff. So that's it. May all of us, all of us, never ever be fair weather followers. Amen. Father God, we're so thankful. Thankful for this series. Thank you for your mighty, mighty word that we get to dig into, peel the onion. I love, Lord, how you speak to each and every one of us in our own place, wherever we're at. So many different levels of, of walk, walking with you, God, is represented here in this church and watching online. And I love how you meet every single one of us right where we're at. So, Lord, grow us, continue to teach us, convict us, reveal to every one of us our next step. My prayer, Lord, is every single week, all of us discover a new next step. And then by doing so, we get closer and closer and closer and closer. 
to you, Jesus. That's all I, I want to get as close as you, as I close to you as I can get, Jesus. That's all I want. You're all I need, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross for each and every one of us. I think of that often. It just wrecks me, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. I say I'm not worthy, but you say I'm to die for. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, continue to pour in each and every one of us. Soften our hearts. Invade our minds. We just love you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Woo! We made it through Exodus, y'all. I know. Man, I feel like we need to have a party or something. <laughs> An Exodus party. <laughs> oh, man. That's cool. You know, our church is fairly new. That's a, our first uh, book of the Bible series. We've had many series, but uh, this has been the first uh, book of the Bible. We went through the whole book. Now, we've been through books of the Bible in our frontline men's ministry and stuff like that, but this is different. And this, is, this has been so good. It's been so better. And, and you know, I, I want to do this often. Uh, I, I, I like getting in the books of the Bible and just going through the book because uh, we are next step Bible church. Let's get in the Bible. I don't want to just cherry pick verses. I want to get in the whole thing and keep it in context, learn the context, learn the hi historical meaning and all that. I just love it. So that's kind of what we're about. That's the kind of church we're going to be. We're going to do some topical stuff, obviously, but um, we're, we're definitely going to be just nose in the word all the time. Well, anyway, let's dismiss. I want to go ahead and dismiss the online crowd. Uh, thank you guys so much for your financial blessings, for your your uh, encouragement and, and all of that. It's just awesome. Uh, I sure enjoy talking to many, many of you, and you know who you are. Um, I had a phone call this week. Uh, from California, and uh, one of my brothers from another mother. Never met the guy in my life. If he walked through this door, I wouldn't know who he was. But over the last, I say three years, maybe four years, I don't know, we've uh, developed a relationship, uh, done some counseling, and he just called me out of the blue this week. Um, he calls me a few times a year, four times a year, whatever, and just, man, just bless my socks off. Uh, uh, just encouraged me. It's, it's awesome. That's what this is about. That's kingdom. That's kingdom work. That's kingdom friendships. That's kingdom fellowship right there. We just chatted on the phone and just act like we're best buds. Never met each other ever, but we uh, both love the Lord. And so uh, anyway, uh, I'm grateful for, for friendships like that. I don't take that for granted. I look for, forward to making other friendships like that as Next Step grows and as uh, people discover us on YouTube. So anyway, online crowd, thank you. Love you so much. And you're dismissed and we'll see you next week. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. <laughs>